Okay, so <clears throat> get back to Hebrews 10 in a minute or so here. Uh, just to review, we're, we're continuing on from last week, and it's because of that letter that got stuffed in our door, and you know where somebody's basically saying, "Does the Bible teach once saved, always saved?" And of course, I googled that, and that was a Jehovah's Witness uh, article. And we said, say, well, why are you preaching on salvation? Because all of us here are saved already. We know that already. But when we're soul winning, do you ever get stumped? Do you ever get somebody bring something up and you don't know what to say about it, right? So if we go through these objections, then maybe you'll remember. But if, if you don't remember, always circle back to the clear scriptures. Say, you know, that's a confusing scripture. These other scriptures where, you know, believe and thou shalt be saved and all these ones, they're clear scriptures. We should always take the clear scriptures over the confusing or unclear scriptures. And we should obviously take the majority over the minority. Like the majority just said, believe and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever believeth in him, you know, it just it goes on and on. Um, so, you know, we went through a list of Bible verses. They had a heading that said, Bible verses that disprove the teaching of once saved, always saved. And I showed that they did not disprove once saved, always saved. Um, there's nothing in the Bible that disproves that. Yes, the Bible does teach once saved, always saved. Um, so the next part of this, um, of their, their article, it says, so they have this list of verses and then that disprove it. In their words, I didn't disprove. And it says, instead, the Bible shows that someone who has been saved can fall away by returning to a practice of serious sin. For example, Hebrews 10, 26 states, if we practice sin willfully, and this is their Bible, okay, so it's not going to match up with yours. Uh, if we practice sinfully after having received the accurate knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins left. And... So what I would say just off the bat, without even getting into scripture too far, is how serious of a sin does it have to be that you lose your salvation? You know? Nobody can show that point to something like that in the Bible. You know, you think you can lose your salvation, but well at what point does like where do you where does it, do you cross the line? Because it's it's always something you're know, really bad at they don't do, right? So but if we get into Hebrews 10 here, so the the, the scripture that they're pointing to is Hebrews 10.26. So we'll read it in King James. Hebrews 10.26. It says, For if we sin willfully after we, that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And amen, this passage is true. There is no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus will never die again. He died once. He was the ultimate sacrifice. We don't do animal sacrifices anymore. There is no more sacrifice for sins. It's not that these objections that we, we think those Bible verses are wrong. No, the Bible verses are right. They're interpreting them wrong is what's happened. And most cases, it's just not taking it in context, right? So let's back up to verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the first word I want to draw your attention to is assurance. We have this assurance of faith. Now, if we could lose our salvation, we don't have an assurance of faith. We have a maybe of faith, right? There's no assurance. There's no guarantee. But we have this guarantee. And verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one to love and to good works. So what they don't realize is a lot of these objections that they bring up, those passages are provoking us to good works. That God wants us to do good works. And it's not that if we don't do the good works that we're going to hell, or if we do bad works that we're going to hell. It's just, you know, the Bible isn't just about how to get saved. If all you wanted is about how to get saved, it could be a lot thinner, right? But of course, everything combines together and works together. The scriptures, we don't just take one thing in isolation. So these passages are, are provoking us onto good love and to good works. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. And then is there a verse that they like. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So that, that verse is saying, if you sin, you know it's sin and you do it anyway, you are sinning willfully. 
okay? And there's no, no sacrifice for sins. But we're already saved with one heaven. This is talking about you knew it was sin, you did it anyway. You got to, you deserve the chastisement of God on your life in this earth. Jesus already paid for your eternal punishment. That's, you don't have to pay for that again. But if people that believe this is about losing your salvation, they better never miss church. Because it says not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Wow. And just there's, there's, and there, they think there may have no more sacrifice for sins. According to that, once you lose your salvation, which is impossible, but if you do, you can never more. There's no chance of you getting saved. So you better not miss one Sunday or, or one midweek service because if you do, according to their interpretation, you're going to hell. There's nothing you can do about it. Like, you see how foolish this interpretation is? It, it just doesn't work. And if we back up even further, let's go to verse 12 in Hebrews 10. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So this is what he's talking about. Jesus died once. He's not going to die again and again and again. He, once was enough. That was enough to pay for all our sins. If we sin willfully after that, yes, we do have the judgment of God upon us. Not for hell, but for our, our lives here. He might, you know, make you get sick or lose money or whatever. Um, that's an easy way to... I'm not, I'm not saying anything is harder or easier for God, but that's one way it's easy to see, right? Financial problems. You know, just, and I'm not saying anybody that has financial problems has a judgment on their life, but I'm saying, even in my own experience, you know, like, it's so easy, you can run into financial problems and, well, you examine yourself first. Okay, well, am I doing everything that God told me to do? If you are, great. It's just, it happens to everybody, right? Well, shouldn't say everybody, but it can happen to everybody. Uh, so verse 12, there's one sacrifice for sins forever. Um, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, that's uh, Jesus Christ, and yes, the right hand of God, there's three persons in the Trinity. Verse 13, from henceforth expect until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He did one offering, and we accept that gift. We're perfected forever. Not perfected until we mess something up. Now, this is obviously talking about our soul. Our soul is reborn. Our, our, our body is not reborn yet. We still have our old flesh. And that will come uh, in the rapture. Okay, the, the first resurrection. But Jesus did that one offering. He perfected us forever. The, the ones that are sanctified. The ones that believe. Verse 15, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He's not going to remember our sins. And remember, this is all in context before verse 26, where it says if we sin willfully, you know, there's no more sacrifice for sins. So this is all before He's, our sins and our iniquities, he won't remember anymore after he's already paid, you know, we've already accepted the gift of payment for them. And then verse 18 says, no more remission of these is there's no more offering for sin. So it's right the next verse, it says there's no more offering for sin, but his, there are sins and iniquities he won't remember anymore. So you've you got to understand the difference between flesh and spirit. And people mix that up, right? They want to rightly divide into seven dispensations. They can't even divide between flesh and spirit, right? Uh, or Old Testament, New Testament, for that matter. Uh, okay, so another verse they have here is Hebrews 6, uh, verse 4 to 6. Give me a couple chapters to turn over there. There's a couple chapters of that. Hebrews 6, uh, verse, verses 4 to 6. Um, and I'm going to read to you from their weird uh, New World Translation here. You look down at King James and see if you can see any difference. Because if you don't, uh, you might better get your eyes shut. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For as regards those who were once enlightened, and who have tasted the heavenly free gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the fine word of God and powers of the coming system of things, but have fallen away, it is impossible to revive them against repentance, because they nail the Son of God to the stake again for themselves and expose them to public shame. 
So they want to say Jesus was just nailed to one stick stuck in the ground, right? And his hands bowed like this. But no, there was, when he shows himself to his disciples, this part isn't my notes, this isn't the subject of the sermon, but I just wanted to point this out. There was the holes in his hands, right? Like, there were nail holes. He, he got nailed on a cross. And the thing is, if he wasn't nailed to a cross, there's so many things in the Old Testament that point to the cross. Even the way they were camped in the Old Testament with the tribes that had a picture of a cross. And when Moses is standing on the hill and there's a guy holding up each side of his hands, because as long as he's standing like that, they're winning. As soon as he let down his arms, they started losing. And so he, he had to keep, it all points to the cross. It's not pointing to a state. But, but like I said, that's not part of, of the sermon today. Other thing they're saying is the coming system of things. Like, it sounds like they're trying to set up this, this new world order. Um, but we'll look at King James, but we'll again get some context. Let's start in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So we already know you got to repent from trusting in your dead works. So we already know that he's saying, we're not going to lay it again. Like, it's just repetitive. You, you, you know, it's, when you're talking to saved people especially, you don't need to keep going on and on about salvation. We do sometimes just because of soul winning, right? And it doesn't hurt to refresh the basics. But even just to explain it to somebody else, and then, ha, what about Hebrews 6? Or, ha, what about Hebrews 10, 26? Or, like, these things, and they think you, they got you. No, they're just deceiving themselves. So, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So this is saying, if they've tasted of it, okay, and they fall away, it's impossible to get saved. Okay? Now this is not talking about you sinning. This is talking about somebody that is enlightened. They understand the gospel, they tasted of it, they didn't swallow it, some people say, but they tasted it, but they did not accept it, okay? And if those people 100% understand it and they decide, no, they don't want to be saved, then it's impossible to renew them again to repent, to change their mind about what they believe. And people, you can't have this both ways. If they think this is talking about losing their salvation, which it isn't, um, because then it's impossible to get saved again. But they will, people will say, well, as long as they have a last breath, it's possible for them to get saved. But on the other hand, they can lose their salvation. Okay, they can lose their salvation, it's impossible to, to be renewed, then, then there is such a thing as reprobates. And it's not that they lost their salvation, it's just that they didn't get saved, but they understood it. And, and you can turn to Romans 1, because Romans 1 and Hebrews 6 go hand in hand. We're going to start in verse 21 of Romans 1. So these people, they, they, they were enlightened. So it's not that they didn't understand the gospel. They already tasted of the heavenly gift. They tasted of the heavenly gift, but they did not receive the heavenly gift. They just tasted it. They know what it's about. They know what it tastes like. But they, 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 they fell away. Okay? Uh, Romans 1, 21. Because that, when they knew God... so. They knew God. They were enlightened. You can see, see that's parallel with, with this Hebrews 6. They knew God. They glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became, in their, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So that's where it is. Their foolish heart was darkened. That's the part about impossible to renew them again on repentance, because their heart is darkened. And we see later in in Romans 1, um, God gives them up unto vile affection. Verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use to that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their last one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, 
receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate minds to do those things which are not convenient. So they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They had God in their knowledge. They were enlightened. They, were, they tasted of the heavenly gift, but they didn't want to retain that in their knowledge. They, no, I hate God. I don't want anything to do with Him. What happens? God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And as we see in the Old Testament, reprobate silver shall men call them because uh, the Lord has rejected them or something like that. Or maybe it says God has rejected them. So once God rejects somebody like that, it's game over. It's too late. And then, you know, the Bible keeps them going with all these things that they're being filled with all unrighteousness and it just lists, lists all these wicked things. And which brings us to our next uh, point, or their next point, I guess. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. And I'm not going to bother reading their false version. Uh, we're just going to go straight to the King James. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So here we see again, this is the part where they get enlightened. They, they escaped it by understanding the knowledge of the Lord. They, they, they escaped the world through the knowledge. They didn't get saved. They just escaped it by understanding it. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worth with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. So... Look at that. Knowing the way of righteousness. They knew the way of righteousness. Then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But then this has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed her wallowing in the mire. Like, it doesn't help giving your pig a bath. Okay? If they, they're just going to go get money again. That's what happened to these people. Their dogs go to their own puke again. They... Escaped the, war, the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord. They got enlightened. They tasted of the heaven again. And what it, does it say? It was better if they didn't even have even known that. Why? Because now it's impossible for them to get saved. Before it was still possible for them to get saved, they're better off not knowing the gospel. So they say, well, why don't we preach the gospel to people that? Well, how do we know they're going to turn out like that? And the thing is, they're, they're damned anyway if, if they don't believe the gospel. So, it, it's their decision to re reject God. Uh, so, their article, as you can see, at 2 Peter, Romans 1, Hebrews 6, they all go hand in hand. They think it's talking about losing your salvation. This is rejecting the gospel once you clearly understand it and becoming a reprobate. That's what these three passages are talking about. So, their article keeps going. Jesus emphasized the importance of maintaining faith by giving an illustration in which he likened himself to a vine and his followers to branches on that vine. Some of them would at one time demonstrate faith in him by their fruits or actions, yet would later fail to do so and be thrown out like a fruitless branch, losing their salvation, he said. And then he's saying back is John 15, 1, 6. And I'm not going to go through that whole passage because we, I preached in John 15 just two Thursdays ago. But John 15, 6 says, If a man abide not me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So, they say, you know, if somebody you know, falls into sin, men is, people are going to, they're, they're saying that God throws them into hell, right? Where it says men gather them, and I guess, if you fall into sin, you get thrown in the fire. Well, I guess you can't get saved then, after all. They think you can get, you know, lose your salvation, gain it, you, you know, get unborn, and then get reborn, and unborn, and then reborn. And it's just ridiculous. So if this is talking about salvation, they are burned. You're at a point now where you can't get saved anymore. So it's ridiculous. And I'm not going to repeat that, repeat that whole message. So they said John 15, 1, 6. The Apostle Paul used a similar illustration of saying that Christians who do not maintain their faith will be locked off, is what their Bible version says. Romans 11, 17 to 22. Romans chapter 11. So he... They are saying that Paul said if they don't maintain their faith, they're going to be locked off, you know, uh, like pruning a tree. And Romans 11 does talk about branches, and we're going to read it. They, uh, and we'll read the verses that they got there, 17 to 22. 
Verse 17, some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, and them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. So what we've got to understand is, why does it mean to be cut off? Does it mean lose your salvation, like they say, or not? Because they're talking about these these branches that were broken off that you could be grafted in. Who are these branches that were broken off? It was the Jews. Why did they get broken off? Because they sinned too much? No, because they didn't believe. Okay? Now, their branches came from their ancestors, right? Like the, the, the tree keeps growing the trunk, and then the trunk, you get branches, and from the branches, you can get branches splitting off. And you're in that tree because your parents uh, were part of this, this group, okay? You don't just get to stay in this tree if you don't believe. Okay, now this, this, this tree actually, that's a, Israel had this job of spreading God's word and they didn't do it in the Old Testament. And this isn't talking about salvation, you're just going to be cut off from this, this group, okay? And if it is talking about salvation, I'm not saying I understand this 100%, but if it was talking about salvation, these people didn't actually believe already that are getting broken off. Because verse 20 says, well, because of unbelief they were broken off. So, if you believe, you're not getting cut off. The only reason you can't get cut off is not because you did bad works, it's because you didn't believe. That's the admonition Paul's giving them. And, I mean, this anti-easy believism crowd, like they're against easy believism. They, they, they say it like as if it's a bad word, easy believism. They so get that sometimes at the door. You know, they don't think they can lose their salvation, but they don't believe in easy believism. And then you ask them, a little bit more, oh yeah, if you commit suicide or if you reject God, then, then you can lose your salvation. So, um, yeah, so that's where the difference is. Um, but the other thing is, Hebrews 11 comes after chapter 10, okay? And what is chapter 10? I think we all go there when we're soul winning. And... It says exactly the gospel that Paul is preaching it, is preaching. Look at verse 8 in Romans 10. But what saith it? Okay, so what, what is it saying? The, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So this is what the, the, the word of faith that they're preaching. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Where's the works in there? There is no works in there. This is what Paul was preaching. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And does it say, with the arms and the legs, you keep being saved? No, it doesn't. It just, it's your heart, you believe, and with your mouth, your confession, confession made unto salvation. That's it. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So if their interpretation was right, you could lose your salvation. Even if you had believed on Jesus Christ. Guess what? You're going to be ashamed at the resurrection of, like, after the thousand years. When the people that are down also wake up. You would be ashamed because your sins were not forgiven. And you do not believe the, the heavenly gift. You do not accept that gift. It was so easy and you didn't do it. Somebody even knocked your door and tried to explain it to you and you didn't do it. Like, just imagine how ashamed these people will be. You know, that's why we shouldn't feel bad when somebody slams the door in our face. We should feel bad for them. Hey, they're going to be ashamed one day. You know, they're make, trying to make us ashamed when they slam the door in our face, but we should leave for joy because that would give us extra rewards. For them, they're going to be ashamed when they think back on that. And you don't think they're going to have time to think back on that exact moment when they reject it? Yeah, they've got eternity to think about it. But everything. While they're screaming and yelling. Okay, so we'll keep on going with their... <laughs> their best attempt at trying to disprove actual salvation. Uh, Christians are commanded to keep on the watch. Matthew 24, 42... 
um, 25 and thir uh, verse 13. So I'll just read those to you. Oh, I'll just actually keep reading this uh, paragraph here. Those who fall asleep spiritually, whether by practicing works belonging to darkness, or by not fully performing the works that Jesus commanded, lose their salvation. And then they list a few other ones. Romans 13, 11, and Revelation 3. So Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord hath come. See, they're saying if you don't do the works, you lose your salvation. I don't see how they get that. Right there. 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. This is talking about, you don't want to be ashamed when Jesus comes back, even though you're saved, and you're, maybe you fell back into being a drunk or something like that. When Jesus comes back, and he, he, he takes you away, just even imagine if you were drunk at that moment, obviously your body will get, you get a new body, but that's embarrassing. Like, Jesus wanted his servants to, to work for him while he's gone, and he comes back after having established the kingdom, and... You're, you're, you know, you're an embarrassment. To that would be embarrassing. So we should watch to see when Jesus is coming, and also so we won't be offended in those three and a half years that lead up to him coming back, as we talked about on Thursday. Those, these things have I spoken on to that you should not be offended or something like that. Uh, I think it was John sixteen one. Okay, so Romans 13, 11, uh, starting 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. And I, I remember this verse because I was in a, you know, obviously a church that didn't preach the gospel in the summer club, Mennonite church. And I remember this because I was sleeping and that woke me up and my head came up. My brother said, the guy that sat beside me, same thing, his head came up. And it's like, oh, sleeping? <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing, I guess, but I mean, a, a church is a, a joke, you know, a bad joke, like I'm saying. Okay, uh, verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He has this an admonition to quit sinning. And it is telling us the, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And basically it's saying, get to work. Your, your time here is, is dwindling, right? You're, you're running out of time. Get to work. You know, don't, don't riot. Don't be drunk in uh, chambering and wantonness. Like, and strife and envying. You know, like arguing with people and, and envying their goods and things like that. Like, no, like just walk honestly and make no provision for the flesh. Um, and, and you read their their version there; it's really weird. Anyway, um, talk about brazen conduct. Uh, but anyway, we can skip that their version because it's just a joke. Okay, Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three, verse one. Remember, these are, these, these are, are uh, supposed proofs that if you fall asleep spiritually by practicing works belonging to darkness or by not fully performing the works of Jesus' command, you can lose your salvation. That's, that's what these are. And I know you can't see it, neither can I. Okay? It, there's nothing in here about that. Revelation 3.1 And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven spirit, and the seven stars, I know their works, that thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful of strengthening the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If thou if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know shall not know what hour I will come upon thee. And remember this is this is let the, the letters to the seven churches, right? This is to the church of Sardis. It's not talking about individuals. He said, he, he's, he's warning them to be watchful, and to strengthen the things that remain. And he's saying, because if you don't, I'm going to come on as a thief. As a thief okay? They're going to be surprised when he comes back. And they're not going to know what hour that he's coming back. And nobody knows the hour right now. 
okay? And we won't know the hour then either, but we'll see it approaching, right, with the different signs that happen, especially when we see them in the clouds and we know it's this time. Um, okay, so yeah, I didn't see anything in there either, but you gotta remember, these people, if you, when you got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. That's what, basically, these people, they got a hammer in their hand, uh, losing their salvation, they try to grasp that each one, oh, that one maybe you can twist it to, 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 to mean that you lose your salvation or that if you don't, aren't, don't have the right works when Jesus comes back, then you lose it. You know, they're, they're just trying to grasp at straws here. Uh, and then they keep going on with their uh, article. Many scriptures show that the, those who have been saved must still endure faithfully to the end. Um, Matthew 24, 13, Hebrews 10, 36, 12, 2, and and 3 in Revelation 2.10. First century Christians expressed joy when they learned that fellow believers were enduring in their faith. Well, yeah. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 3, 3, John, uh, verse 3, 4. Does it seem reasonable that the Bible would stress faithful endurance if those who did not endure would be saved in any way? Yes, it seems reasonable to me. Because it's like, yeah, it goes it's over and over again and again, right? So here's, here's the verses. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And, and so many people, like the Calvinists, right? The, the full 5.2 of Calvinists, they say, you've got to endure unto the end. Perseverance of the saints is the P in Tula. Um, this is not talking about spiritual salvation. This is talking about physical salvation. And you say, how? Prove it. Well, drop down a couple verses to verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the life's sake, those days shall be shortened. This is talking about your salvation of your flesh. Okay? Because if, if God did not shorten those days, all the Christians would die off because they're, they're searching for them with thermal imaging cameras. They got, you know, cameras everywhere. I just read an article in one of my trade magazines. City of Calgary has a thousand cameras that are converting to IP cameras from old analog, and they're, they're converting that with their, their weather map and, and all sorts of different things so that they've got situational awareness, right? And they, the article went on to explain that security cameras aren't just used for security anymore, they're used for different other things like logistics and, and different things. And, and you don't think they're going to start keeping track of people like they do in China? Where if you don't have a good social score, you maybe can't shop in certain stores or you can't have certain jobs. Like, things like that can easily happen here in Canada as well. So, if Jesus, if God did not shorten those days, no flesh could be saved. Because try to hide from an infrared camera, okay? Uh, when I was in the fire department, we, we had one of these handheld FLIR, forward-looking infrared. And... You could see the where somebody had stepped or put their hand on the wall. That heat was still there, okay. And you, you think you, you're you're hiding, but you, you can see your heat signature. And the military obviously had way better ones, okay. And that's why I, you know, you wonder why they didn't find those guys up in, in Gillum in the summer a long time ago. But anyway, that's that's another story. So except those days should be short, and no flesh should be saved. Uh, here's the. Here's another so-called proof. For ye have need of patience that, this is Hebrews 10, 36. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So they're saying the promise is salvation, okay? And they're saying you have to do the will of God to get this promise, okay? They don't understand, probably not, about, about rewards. For one thing, the Jehovah's false witnesses don't even believe in heaven except for the 144,000. But John 6.40 tells us what the will of God is. John 6.40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. What's the condition? You believe on him. That's the condition. That's it. And that's his will. It, that people would believe on him and have everlasting life, that he will raise them up at the last day. That's the will of God. It's as simple as that. No, that doesn't mean that God wants us just to sin, but that's his will that people would believe. He gave us a way out. Okay, Revelation 2.10. This is another one. Let me see. Uh, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, 
that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So they're saying you have to be faithful unto death to get salvation. But does it say, be thou faithful unto death so that you can be saved? No, it says, and I will give thee a crown of life. A crown is a reward, okay? A crown of life is a reward. It's, it's a, a crown is a treasure. And it's a status symbol too. And you think, that's not impressive. impressive. Wait, listen to maybe their best proof. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Do you see it? Now let me read it again. Pay attention. Maybe you'll get it this time. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Still didn't see it? Well, I didn't either. I didn't, there doesn't, there's nothing in there but even salvation, losing it. Like It's just, it, it doesn't make, make sense, right? Um, he's, he's talking about how, how, how he gives thanks to God for them. He, he's making mention of them in prayers. And he's remember, remembering the work that they do for, for the kingdom of God. Okay? There's nothing about that you have to work um, for salvation. Um, the, the last one in that part of the article. If I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, this is 3 John uh, chapter 1, verse 3 4. If I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, testify of the truth that is in me, even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Yeah, I mean, I have no greater joy than that my children do the right thing too, but if they don't, am I going to throw them in a fire? No. This is ridiculous. This, does, this doesn't teach anything about losing your salvation. This is just, he's happy when his children walk in the truth. And his children could be the ones that he, he's gotten saved in, in, in the Lord, right? Through the gospel. So when, when you get people saved and then you hear, yes, they're in church, they're, you get other people saved, that does be like, yes, right on. Okay? Continue the article. I think we're just going down the GFW article here. Um, only when his death was imminent did the apostle Paul feel that his salvation was assured. 2 Timothy 4, 6, 8. So they got to say that at one point Paul thought his salvation was assured. But they say, you know, earlier than, than he did. But only once his death was imminent did, did he feel assured about it. Earlier in his life, he recognized that he could still miss out on salvation if he gave in to fleshly desires. We'll see what proof we give for that. He wrote, I come on my body and lead it as a slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself should not become di disapproved somehow. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Philippians 3, 12, 14. Okay, so they, earlier they said, this is where Paul's saying this in 2 Timothy 4, 6, 8, where he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. What? I thought they're, they said this was just with Paul at the end of his life being assured of his salvation. But in verse 8 here it says, not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. And, you know, and, and they're saying, you've got to keep the faith so you can get saved. It's ridiculous. The other one was 1 Corinthians 9.27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And then the King James says, keep under my body. There says, humble my body. So these Jehovah's false witnesses are beating themselves up. Or they're saying that Paul was beating himself up. And I don't even know how you would beat yourself up. But anyway, I'll leave it for those guys. Um, so they're saying this means that you that he, he only at the end of his life was assured of his salvation. So if you back up one verse 
on this passage to verse 26. It says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beat, oh, oh, sorry, that's, uh, yeah, not, so fight I not as one that beat it here. So he's running not uncertainly. He's not beating there. He doesn't, it's not like as if he doesn't know that he's going to get saved. He's not doing it uncertainly. He has this assurance. He has this certainty. Down to Philippians chapter 3. When we were in Philippians last week, um, that's because they use some other parts of it. Um, I tried to use it. Philippians 3 verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, um, th this is not uh, one of the clearest verses in the Bible. They use big words like apprehended, right? Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to understand. It isn't, okay? But people will try to use unclear verses like this and then disregard really clear ones. Okay? And so he, he, he says, I count not myself to apprehend. So they say, see, Paul didn't think he had gotten salvation yet. Well, that's partly true. Paul was saved, but his body had not got, been redeemed yet as far as his body hadn't gotten, he hadn't gotten his new body yet. He hadn't come to the day of redemption. But you know what's interesting is their false version proves this point even less, if you back up one verse, even less. To see, in verse 11 it says, to see if at all possible I may attain to the earlier resurrection from the dead. Not that I had already, have already received it or I'm already perfect. Well, no kidding, he hasn't resurrected from the dead yet. He hasn't died yet. So you see, even their version it is re ridiculous to say that, that it teaches that Paul thought he hadn't got saved. It just, he's just saying he hasn't resurrected yet. He hasn't been got his new body. In Ephesians 4.30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're guaranteed to go to heaven. But that process hasn't happened yet where we've come out of the grave and gotten the new body or we've just start taking off, I don't know if the angels will grab us one in each arm and we'll start flying and get our new body in the air, or how it'll work, but we'll get our new body in there, we'll be transformed if we're still alive at that time. Otherwise we'll come out of the grave. So that part hasn't happened yet. So when people use things like that to, to say, see, he wasn't sure about his salvation. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. So that, that, was their, that was their article. So I just want to give you a couple of things to think about. That was their whole article. And next Sunday we will go through the United Church part of the article, or uh, the letter they gave us. Or whoever gave us. I don't know who it was that gave it to us. Um, 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall be cleared, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So even if all the, this guy's works burn up, he still gets to be saved by fire. And actually, I think it was uh, maybe me and, was it you, Jeremy, that we had somebody bring us up at a door one time? Uh, I don't know who I was with. Anyway, there's talking with this one about, you know, the different works of being tried by fire. Yeah, and I think it was Jeremy said, yeah, but he himself also shall be saved. And I think we even went to it and showed him, and he, he, had, he had to think about that, because I guess he hadn't seen that. Yeah, your works are going to be burned, but you're still saved. So people say, you know, want to say, you know, if you do bad enough sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Here, here, this is my last point. Is teaching heresy sin? It's absolutely a sin, right? It's a really bad sin, teaching something wrong with the Bible. 
Let's say it's something wrong with the Bible, but not teaching wrong with salvation, okay? Maybe they got the end times mixed up or whatever, okay? So you think, though, if you can lose your salvation, preaching things falsely under the Bible, that would be one thing you can lose your salvation for, right? What does the Bible say about it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, 20 says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But so whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This person is still in the kingdom of heaven, even though he broke the commandments and he taught other people to do that. He's still in heaven. Why? Because he got saved. He, he took that free gift of salvation. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how do these verses go together? Is this person that's teaching, a breaking the commandments and teaching other people to do that, is his, is, is his righteousness exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Well, he's sinning, right? Well, what this is saying is, Nobody's going to get there unless you have that wedding garment on. That you've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're not going to get it in there. You're not going to get in there. You're not getting in there by your own works. If you do wrong things, you may be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but you're still in the kingdom. That's the important part. Last place that we'll go for, for today. Uh, Matthew 22, uh, verse 12 and 13. You can turn there if you want. So this is just talking about that wedding garment that I was telling you about. And he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Find him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he didn't get thrown into utter darkness because he'd done some bad things. It's because he didn't have the proper covering. He didn't have the wedding garment. If we don't have a wedding garment when, when at the resurrection, we'd be thrown in hell too. But we have a wedding garment. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have His blood that's paid for our sins on us. And that's why we get to go to heaven. Not because we're, we're keeping from sin and doing all these good works. It's because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So, yes, the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. And hopefully that's been a help to you. That you know, when somebody throws Hebrews 6 at you or 2 Peter 2.20 or one of these things, you have an idea of what this stuff is about. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for salvation, making it so easy that a child can understand it and that, you know, we don't have to do some, some hard works, but that you know, we can just believe in success that day. Please help us to show other people how easy it is and, and to uh, answer their questions and preach the gospel. Jesus, name.